thank you very much for coming. I'm very happy to be here. I hope everyone else had some good sessions. But um, My name is Patrick Uppatham. I'm a global director for uh, advanced security research within Vertisys. Uh, what we do is a, we're a very data-centric type of endpoint solution. But that being said, prior to that, uh, my background is uh, U.S. Uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation doing offensive defensive research technologies, both for counterterrorism, uh, foreign counterintelligence, high technology crimes, also doing just normal types of security consulting. So penetration testing, forensics, incident response, things of that nature. I always find that it helps to have the, the speaker's types of background to have a little bit of perspective of where I'm coming from when I actually talk about this kind of stuff. Um, so uh, with that being said, without further ado, when we start talking about things, obviously the, the actual presentation here is really uh, kind of data protection, but really focusing on data and why data, right? Uh, there's a lot of different types of solutions out there that say that they protect their data or protect your data, part of an enterprise. But a lot of times it's kind of an indirect kind of thing where they're saying that they're actually protecting the castle as opposed to protecting the data. Uh, but in that case, I mean, for data itself, I mean, data is really the lifeblood, right? But data is also the target, generally speaking, for a lot of different types of, different types of attacks. So you have two different types of categories that I like to actually break things down into. One of them would be something that I like to call also digital ordnance. So if you're familiar with ordnance, like very similar to a military term, you have munitions, maybe explosives or whatnot. Those kind of category of attack, you know, analogous to pulling the pin of a grenade, throwing it in. Same things with pieces of malware, like maybe Stuxnet or something, something along those lines. A person double clicking it, they don't really care what happens afterwards except for the fact that the, the target is neutralized or in some way, shape or form potentially rendered neutralized. Then you have the other form, uh, in which case we're, we're going to be focusing on, which is exfiltration of data. And exfiltration of data or the stealing of data, mostly for counter espionage or uh, for pur purposes of different uh, maybe nation state programs that might be run. Depending on your organization, obviously, it may or may not affect you, uh, but it affects all of us in certain different ways. Right? Now, that being said, I don't think anyone here in the room can actually argue the fact that the amount of data that we have in this day and age is obviously growing exponentially. Right? Um, but when it comes down to it, the amounts of data, uh, when we look at it, we, we really have to, when we're focusing on that particular aspect, in the organization, it's very difficult to actually be able to identify if you're, especially if you're doing kind of discovery. For those people who are doing e-discovery and doing snapshots of petabytes of data, I empathize with you, right? The fact of the matter is that if you've ever run one of those kinds of projects, it could take months, potentially years, to actually categorize all that data. And then to realize that it's a snapshot in time, only at one point in time, it's a little disheartening at some points. But uh, what we'll go through also is just being able to, how do you identify the data, classify it, and be able to follow it dynamically as users are accessing it, as users are creating it, as users are manipulating that particular piece of data. But, Another part of the focus also is the, you know, the traditional security mechanisms, right, or the traditional uh, network infrastructure components that most companies would already have. We have, you know, application security, different endpoint technologies, HIPs, antivirus, different types of network security appliances, and obviously the, the market is a buzz with different types of market, uh, different types of network security uh, appliances that you all know. Um, for that matter, for the digital, for the traditional security appliances, nowadays you just slap on the word next gen, and then you've got a new a product, right? They're trying to keep up with the keep, keep, keeping up with the Joneses, but again, it doesn't take a genius to see that even throughout all this, you see that from the from the news headlines, the breaches are still occurring, right? So the traditional the traditional network infrastructure components really still aren't really doing it for, for that matter, and depending on which potential percentages you're looking at for efficacy of different types of antivirus or endpoint solutions, they range anywhere from maybe 25% efficient or um, effective to maybe, maybe 30, 40, 50%, again, depending on what day of the week you're looking at that. But the question really comes down to is why. Um, and for us, it really comes down to looking at being able to focus on the data and understanding that that data is really coming down to the endpoint. For those people who are also in parts of global enterprises, obviously you have a di geographical disbursements of those of those folks, remote locations. For maybe smaller, mid-sized companies these days, Amazon has changed the face of the market. Right? You don't even need traditional infrastructure anymore. All you got, if you have an idea, you just spring it up. AWS, EC2, get a cloud server. It's up and it's up within days, as opposed to having to re require different types of hardware, software, build outs, and all that kind of stuff. But that being said, it's 
obviously taking away that traditional infrastructure from you and having someone third party own it as well. So there's always that kind of a different kind of weird paradigm of where is that data being shared and how is it being shared. But because it's your lifeblood, you want to protect it. But at the same time, because it's your lifeblood, part of the company, you also want to share it. And that sharing, that secure sharing and collaboration is always going to be that very similar to like when maybe relationships in your teenage years. It gets complicated, right? So, but when it comes down to it though, when we're talking about the data, the data is really the target. It's not so much as the malware events, atomic malware events that different types of vendors are looking for. You're, the actual goal is to be able to potentially identify the data, take it, steal it, maybe manipulate it in some way, exfiltrate it out, out of the network. Could happen via the network, could happen on the endpoint, could happen in a couple of different ways. If you really want to be smart about it, you could actually have maybe a potential piece of malware that drops on there, puts it, find, identifies maybe some different types of backup servers, it pushes it out to the backup servers and you maybe, maybe do an armored car heist of like maybe the Iron Mountain beta, data backup tapes or anything like that. You don't even have to go through the network at that point in time, right? But the, this particular slide is not necessarily meant for kind of an ulterior derision towards different types of um, network solutions out on the market, but it's purely just a sense that these particular network solutions are very, 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 very popular these days, right? And there, there's a reason, and there's always, there's, I'm not here to discount the value of the different types of, uh, different types of next gen types of solutions that are based heavily on the network. A lot of them are actually going to a little bit with endpoint technologies as well. But that being said, I mean, these ones, they're pretty easy. And just as the nature is for most network components, right? They kind of go in, they're, they're nice, they can actually aggregate a lot of traffic, and behind that, a lot of different users. But when you look at it, Sometimes uh, they can be kind of expensive, but really you can actually replace these names with just about any other type of vendor, networks, uh, network or potentially endpoint solutions out there. And a lot of times there's alerts, a lot of alerts, right? And the question, the, the question that comes with all these different types of alerts at some point in time, when you get to the, when you get to the certain fact that, you know, again, I don't want to bring too many coincidences, but you have this exponential growth of malware on one side, and then you have solutions that are looking for malware exponential growth of malware, solutions that's looking for malware, right? You might see a lot of alerts in that kind of case scenario. So coincidence, yeah, you know, it's up to you guys, right? But the fact of the matter is that the, all these particular pieces of mal, all these particular pieces of solutions looking for those uh, malware specific events, very atomic in nature, I mean, there's, there's still that huge gap. And there's this ever changing gap that's actually coming to, kind of, kind of coming to this resurgence in 2014. I don't know if anyone was at the RSA show in the US uh, a couple of weeks back, but uh, we were there and endpoint technologies are everywhere these days. It's all about endpoints, all about visibility and whatnot. People are realizing, even the large network, uh, network vendors are realizing that just because you can virtually execute something, have a virtual sandbox or whatnot, you're still missing a lot of things. I mean, number one, how many people here, I and mean, you don't have to raise your hands, but just give me maybe a little like, head nod or something like that. I know, if I mistake it for a food coma, I apologize, but um, how many people here have like policies that allow their users to you know, use webmail or social accounts, right? Probably. A lot of those webmail accounts probably are running SSL because a lot of, Yahoo, Gmail, MSN, doesn't really matter. All of them are almost defaulting to SSL. So I asked the same question for all those people who would say they allow those kind of social media or those webmail types of accounts, how many of you are doing SSL or TLS decryption at the, pro at, the, at the perimeter? Probably a lot less, which means that you're not even seeing any of that data. It's an encrypted ch channel going right out, the, right out the environment. Now, that being said, there's also a whole bunch of other different shortcomings in terms of being able to identify like, what happens. And just again, for the crowd, because I apologize, I don't really know everyone's background here, although I wish I did. The, how many people either are hands-on or actually have a direct line of people who do forensics or incident response? Is there a number of people, can I get, can I get a head nod? Or do a lot of people actually have anything to do with their incident response teams at all? Yeah, we got a couple of people. But typically, when an incident occurs, right, this, there's, a couple of number, there's a number of questions that occur uh, that come out, and they're, they're, fairly, they're fairly obvious and very simple. Like, what are we being hit with, number one? Always a common question. How many machines are affected? You know, where are those machines? Is it propagating, right? 
what can we do? Has it been contained? Has it been mitigated? Well, you know, the question comes out. Very simple questions, but when you're looking at it from just a purely network-centric kind of perspective, it gets very, very difficult to answer. And if you've ever been on one of these kind of conference calls, especially on a global, a global enterprise, you get 30 people on a, con on a con call. Everyone's asking, is the, is the network team on? Yeah. Is the AV team on? Yeah. Is the AV vendor on? Yeah. Is the IT and you know, all these people? Yeah. What, what, what can we do? They're like, nothing. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> Obviously, I don't know if I don't know if you've had this experience, but we just recently had an experience where uh, one of our clients actually had a crypto um, a crypto virus variant hitting some of their machines. They were based in Singapore. Some of their machine users were actually based in South America. So again, thirty person phone call. Everyone's trying to call and trying to figure out. They have the AV vendor who will remain nameless, but they're saying. So it's like, well, our users are, you know, their, their hard drives are being encrypted. What can we do? And the IMT virus vendor says, well, we need a sample. It's like, well, they're in South America. No one's, a, no one's awake. It's 2 AM. It's going to take us hours to get someone on site and try to get a sample. That's like, well, uh, I need a sample. It's like, OK, well, well, can't you give us a definition or something to at least kind of mitigate it for now until we get something else more? And like, well, we need a sample. And you can see that there's a pattern that goes on, right? Because they need the hashes. They need something. They need something more physical in order to run that. But when we were on that particular call, and just based on the fact that we also have potential, um, and what we'll talk about in a little bit here is like always on logging, as well as the perspective of access to data, how and how those particular two uh, aspects can combine, you can identify the different types of all the processes that are being run on a particular machine. You can identify all different types of file movements, but you can also identify, and most importantly, when those particular potential suspicious processes are actually accessing sensitive data. So things that you've already classified as sensitive. And I like to think of it as, you know, if someone were coming in through the, into the conference, there's a couple different, there's a number of windows, there's air ducts, there's many doors. But if someone's walking around and coming through, coming through different, maybe different benches and stools, and then they start kind of going around to different conference rooms, and then they come over here. And if they want to try to grab my wallet, right, with this being my sensitive data, I don't really care where they come from, but if they're trying to grab my wallet, you know, I'm just gonna I'm gonna stop them from grabbing my wallet, and I'm gonna say, you know what? Wh who are you, right? It's like, what are you trying to do? It's like you're not supposed to grab my wallet. You're neither my wife or in my kids, right? But you know, granted, my kids would be a little bit more suspicious. They're pretty young, but that being said, having the access and capability of being knowing, having the visibility of that endpoint, having the visibility and capability of being able to proactively stop it, and then to be able to track down all those audit logs and be able to, at your leisure, essentially, be able to figure out where they were going and what they were doing, where they came in through. That's what I'm talking about, trying to be more proactive in this particular type of, uh, in this particular type of scenario. Um, interesting. Cool. Maybe someone agrees. You guys probably have eye fatigue over these two, these, these two folks, right? But really, this particular, I mean, all political s storms aside, you know, what these guys represent is basically the face of anyone else in your company. Because what you have essentially is authorized individuals with authorized access, abusing that authorized access, potentially with just authorized tools in your environment. You know, for, those who, for those who are familiar with it, RDP, remote desktop, VNC, and a lot of times that uh, remote control software, different types of processes that are used normally by IT folks can be misused. But when you don't have the context of the malicious intent when they're actually acting on data and breaking a security policy, it's really difficult to actually identify any of these guys, or girls for that matter, when, they, when you're looking and focusing on malware events, which is exactly what the, the, the market really is, I don't know, hyped up about. You have this hyper focus on malware events, but really, uh, lack of focus on the on actual visibility of what the data, what the, that that actual concentration of data is, right? So, uh, that being said, when we come down to it, we have the ecosystem, right? So, when we're looking at it, I'm not again not to discount that the fact that you have your next gen inf network infrastructure components, you'll have those there to be able to have some vis visibility and control of potentially unmanaged machines, uh, but. The key to the factor is that you have that endpoint visibility as well and control. Because if you have the remote users, geographically disbursement, again, that uh, example of someone in Singapore having uh, some, some issue uh, with a South American team. 
What I didn't actually say was what happens when we join the phone call. Within about two hours, we were able to say, this, this is the process that was, actually, uh, that was actually malicious on the machines. This is how many machines it was actually run on. This is actually all the machines that it's ever been run on. So we can actually show a trend of propagation. And we could actually also create a rule that um, when we talk about uh, endpoint visibility and control, we're talking at, at the kernel level. And having that capability to stop it proactively, remotely, for regardless of where they are in the world, is huge, especially for those at global enterprises. But also just for smaller enterprises who just have ro like, you know, road warriors, right? But being able to tie them all in as well in a combination within that ecosystem is a, is a, is a very, very important aspect to being able to, again, secure a type of enterprise. So w without, I guess without further ado, there's, although I'm focusing a lot on the data and I'm focusing a, a lot on the, the hyper focus of uh, malware events, uh, I will show you a small, a kind of a quick demo in order to kind of show what this actually can come out to. I gotta, since I can't actually see it on my screen, I'm going to have to turn around a couple of different times. So what I have here is basically a single scenario and something very, very similar, I think, to what people would experience on a normal day. It's a phishing, it's a phishing type of attack. right? Um, but the difference here is that I'm going to have a show the phishing attack through three different perspectives. One from the user's perspective, which you'll see here. One from the attacker's perspective. So you're going to have a voyeuristic almost uh, experience looking over the attacker's shoulder while they perpetrate an attack. And then the third perspective would be from if you had the kind of visibility and control capabilities from an endpoint, what could you actually do, right? So kind of putting uh, money where, the, where, where my mouth is apparently is. So um, when we go through the situation, uh, Jerry, very similarly, in this kind of situation, we have just a normal email coming in. It's the user happens to be the administrator. Um, now there's so many different ways to actually get some user to actually double click on a malicious type of PDF. But what happens is that regardless of how you do it, sometimes, you know, based on the, just based on numbers alone, it's kind of like a dating game, right? It's, if you send out 500,000 emails, all you really need is one person to click on it, right? Um, that person could be anyone or it could be someone very, very special. But in any case, in this case scenario right now, uh, are, are many people familiar with Metasploit or the different types of frameworks out there? Yeah. Maybe. Have anyone, has anyone heard of Metasploit? Everyone's heard of it, right? If you haven't, it's a different type of um, uh, penetration test, uh, penetration framework. It's open source, freely available to anyone. Anyone here can actually download it and start what we call owning people uh, within, a, within a few minutes. It's actually pretty scary. But uh, in this case, Adobe Acrobat is actually putting up a little, a little uh, warning prompt saying, hey, you know what? There's some, there's some malicious script inside, or there's some script, I should say. I shouldn't say malicious yet. There's some script inside this document that's trying to run. But by social engineering, you can actually say the name of the file is actually called to view the encrypted content. Please tick the do not show this message box, again box and press open. Right? So if someone who's looking at it, although you're seeing a, a, a warning prompt, they're seeing a warning prompt about a file that says, hey, you know, this is malign, this is benign, just click on me. Right? Um, so assuming that does happen, if you have the capabilities of um, being able to do, again, proactive, um, proactive process relationship uh, analytics at the endpoint in real time, it doesn't really matter what kind of exploit people are using or trying to use or abuse in that particular type of situation. In this case, again, this is kind of a, this is kind of a plug here, but what we are able to do, because we're at the kernel level, we have the capability of baselining certain types of anomalous activity. To, regardless of whether or not it's an OS or the user. And OS and user actually, they kind of blend. Because you've probably heard this before. When you have an outside attacker, an external attacker coming in, a lot of times nowadays, when they, they, the easiest method these days now to actually get, to get into a company is to just do social engineering. Gone are really the days where you had that, the vulnerability pen testing type of methodology where you're doing recon on a network, you're doing port scanning, you're doing vulnerability assessment, exploitation, and then you're trying to pivot throughout the rest of the network. It doesn't really happen that way. It's a lot cheaper, a lot easier just to have, send out 500,000 emails and just have one person click on them and just, get, just welcome the vampire right into your house. Right? But in this case scenario, we're able to actually bring it up this is also something that's kind of seminal to the point of having kind of visibility. Being able to prompt a user, 
Uh, you wouldn't necessarily use this prompt or a kind, this kind of a prompt for all users, but say you wanted to actually bring to the attention of maybe some more technical savvy folks the fact that something weird is going on in the background, right? You have the potential to stop it, but you know, in this case scenario, I'm giving my user, in, in this case the demo, a choice. Um, if we were to stop it, the infection would never occur, and this would be a very, very short demo, right? But otherwise, you know, if we let it, if we kind of let it ride and we allow it to continue, we can actually see the different types, again, what the benefits are for visibility as well as the capabilities of having a, having a different type of agent on a machine closest to the user. So accepting and continuing, uh, for some people who are familiar with types of malware, you might have seen a telltale little black screen pop up and disappear, right? But we'll get to that in just a moment. What happens here is actually very, very unremarkable, in fact. Um, the desktop of the user, there's actually nothing that happens. And this is done on purpose because for users who actually, you know, who double click on things or who are subject to an attack, at that point in time, actually a lot of stuff is completely unbeknownst to them. And everything's, it's kind of like a, like a duck swimming in water, right? Very calm, cool, majestic on the top of the water, but underwater, they're kicking like hell, right? In this case, we, fast, we have to fast forward a few minutes um, just so that, uh, just because there's nothing happening on the desktop. But what you'll see is all of a sudden a change in the desktop right now. And again, we're bringing this, we're kind of bringing this prompt. So we bring attention to the user. Hey, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just been going on based on the fact that you allowed that something to, to actually execute in the background. And what you could do, I mean, in this case, we're taking a kind of a draconian method. We're, we're dropping the hammer. We're, we're going to block all different types of uh, operations. We're going to quarantine the box. We're going to cut off network ca capabilities. We're going to cut off any email capabilities. We can even lock them out of the box if you so chose. But in a general, in an enterprise environment, you could also tier that based on the context thresholds. So having the anal data analytics actually move to the endpoint as well in a very memory efficient and optimized way allows you to really do a lot of interesting things purely based on context. So, I mean, we have malware events, we have data, and the context of how they're being used. And this is, again, kind of going to the point of what we'll be talking about in just a few minutes. So at this point in time, you could threshold it if you so chose and maybe prevented someone, you know, after a certain amount of different types of suspicious events, block them from sensitive file servers or block them from emailing any kind of sensitive documents going out to the external, external of your enterprise or whatnot. And then eventually after a number of uh, more of a subsequent events occur, you could actually just quarantine them in real time, giving and buying your incident response teams time to actually be able to investigate the computer, look at the logs, do whatever they need to. It, you know, if this were the case for a lot more types of organizations, you'd have a lot less post-mortems where the data has already left the, has already left the barn, so to speak, and you would have more, more time to be able to actually say, okay, let's just figure out what's going on. We blocked it. Now let's assess the damage. So, that was just a quick thing from the user's perspective. We have two prompts, said and done, right? But now from the attacker's perspective, so for those people who actually said that they were familiar with Metasploit, this should come as no surprise. Um, it doesn't come as very, very clear with the lights here, but we have a terminal screen here in the foreground. Uh, and in the right-hand top corner, what we're going to see, we're going to change things around and look at it from the attacker's perspective. So if you're an attacker and uh, the upper right-hand corner, obviously, is the screen that we were just looking at. So this kind of uh, synced up in real time. For attackers these days, it's very, 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 uh, can be very unsophisticated. So, I mean, there's managed services, basically, for crimeware. It's pretty ridiculous. They have nice GUIs. They have all wizard setups. You, you don't, all you have to know, how, all you have to do is know how to point, click, and maybe potentially type. Most of them are just drop-down wizards. They're great. Um, it, they're actually, I mean, if you wanted to build a nice, software as a service business, you might even model it after some of these crimeware packs. They're fantastic. Not to say that anyone here would, but I'm just saying. <laughs> it's an option, I guess. Um, so what we, I was talking about kind of throwing out the arbitrary number of 500,000, but let's just say as, a, as an attacker, you, you, know, you have a day job, and in the background, you've just create, crafted, let's, again, let's use 500,000 as the arbitrary number. 500,000 emails, you just sent them out. Right? You're waiting, you're, you come back from your day job, you come down, sit with a cup of, cap, cup of cappuccino, you're waiting for someone to have clicked on your potential malicious file. Right? In this case, we have here, we got the block, uh, the potential block prompt here, but we're going to continue on. These can be automated, but in this case, case scenario, what we're doing is obviously we're, we're looking at it from 
a targeted attack, someone who's actually physically at the keyboard. We've allowed the, we've allowed the execution of the process to go on, so as soon as someone allows the vampire in, you'll see that there's some action that starts to happening on the very left-hand side, sending stage, blah, 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 blah. What that means is actually a reverse tunnel, so an actual remote connection from the target person's machine, the victim, is now being established to my attacker's machine. At this point in time, if this was an automated attack, there's a number of things that could happen. They usually identify your geographical uh, IP, like IP location. They identify your architecture, the context of the user that you're in. In this case, I'm an administrator. They want to try to find out your upload and download speeds. They want to find out you know, how much hard drive space you have on your computer. All of this is actually commoditized into that, remember what I was saying, by their, their crimeware screens. They can actually take it and split it all up, and they can lease out each aspect of your computer. So that 500,000 emails that I just I spent three minutes creating, I can now multiply that by all these number of machines that I can now I now compromise, and each one of those I can make that, I can order them to actually create another 500,000. You know, it's 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 a nice it's a nice exponential growth for an attacker, and one of the reasons why you see so much of the malware out these days. But a couple things you can also do. Uh, so in this particular screen, if you're not familiar with uh, the Metasploit, what they they have a platform that allows you to what they call it, inject into memory. Um, it allows, it's basically the malware that's live, resident in a machine. And it allows you to do a number of little things. And one of the things is uploading files and executing files. So under the context of that user, I can actually upload these particular files. And you'll notice that these are very vaguely named. C.exe, W.exe, whatever it is, very, very common for malware. If this had been an automated attack, just regular commodity piece of malware, you'll typically see you know, one piece of malware drop down. It might explode and drop down maybe some other executable files, maybe some DLL helpful files. Or it might go out to the web, something you've probably heard for CNC communications or command and control, or uh, callbacks, what they also been called as well. They'll pull down some additional types of helper utilities that any good consultant or any, any good contractor is going to bring their own tools, right? For a specialized job, and this is not unlike that kind of a uh, that kind of a kind of a scenario. While we're uploading the different types of tools to this particular uh, target machine, there's a number of other things that we can do. One of the files that we've actually uh, uploaded is called stealthbat.exe. So this gets a trying to give a little bit of a revelation of what might occur in the in the future. From the user or from the perspective of us looking over the shoulder of an attacker, you can see that. How many things have you identified so far? You've identified maybe only a couple pieces of items that are pretty vague. The attacker has access to your target machine. They've uploaded a few binaries, and they've executed one of them. If you notice the command execute dash f stealth bat dot exe. Outside of that, uh, even if you were looking over the shoulder, it's still hard to tell what was going on, right? So just keep that in mind as we, as we kind of go through. What else can we do while we're on the person's machine? Well, we can do a number of things. So for instance, one of the tools that was uploaded by the attacker in this case was something called MSPQ. It's actually a port scanning, a command line port scanning utility from Microsoft, circa 2003. It's an actual native Microsoft tool that allows you to do port scanning on machines. If you're not familiar with port scanning, well, uh, port scanning allows you to actually identify sensitive or potentially sensitive or vulnerable services um, on machines. But in this case, we're internal to the organization. So we're doing something that you probably heard also called lateral propagation, or at least doing reconnaissance on internal of the organization. The network perimeter tools aren't going to see this. And if you have tools in your organization that are looking for machine to machine, internal machine to machine communications, Come find me afterwards. I'd like to talk to you guys because it's very difficult. Number one, but I'd love to see. I'd love to hear what your setup is. But th this is this is a kind of a. Uh, typically, if you're doing this in a stealthy method, you're not going to do. So you're not you're not going to perform such a brazen method of active reconnaissance. You'd actually be doing something called passive reconnaissance. But again, to make it a little bit more interesting, we're going to do active. Um, also, what can you do as a user? So. We can actually also rifle around the different types of files. Now, again, typically, if you were an automated script, you would have something that's automatically looking through different potentially sensitive directories, maybe trying to enumerate certain types of sensitive servers on the network. But in this case, you know, I just noticed that I just changing my directory to a desktop on the user, and I'm looking to see certain files, and I can see two files of interest: boring data and confidential data. Right? So you discern for yourselves which one might be more interesting. Right? 
but I also have a capability of reading these files from the command line. So I use a tool called cat, which is uh, short for concatenate, but um, it will allow me to read the contents. If you can't read it based on the lighting, it says, you know, nothing interesting here, not interesting data, right? But one of the things in the background that's also occurred and uh, kind of seminal to the, the idea here is being able to not so much care so much about the potential aspects of malware, again, atomic unique malware events or potentially suspicious events that are occurring on the system, but being able to identify, classify, and actively protect things that matter most. Again, my wallet, for example, right? If I try to open up the confidential file, in this case scenario, so I do a cat confidential.txt, you'll see a couple things happening, something very similar to what you saw before, right? The screen is changing. At the command line here, you see nothing except an error that occurs on, to, on the command line here. So what we're doing is we're kind of, we could have stopped the infection from occurring from the get-go, but allowing it to go through, we're allowing it also just to do something on the machine, you know, whatever the norm of business might be. It could be suspicious, it might not be. But at the end, we don't, we're, we're, we're separating the wheat from the chaff and we're excluding and filtering out that noise and focusing on the event that matters the most a suspicious process that's on the machine that's trying to access your sensitive data. You know, once, I mean, this is a, again, this is a, this is a particular type of scenario that, um, that, that could happen in your organization. What we look at from this point on is um, a slightly different kind of interpretation. So the interpretation here would be from what kind of logging that we would have or what logging you possibly could have if you were trying to look for a type of solution in this kind of architectural mindset, right? So, um, Obviously, this is our particular console, but I mean, anyone else who's particularly potentially doing this could also could also uh, have this type of information. Oh, sorry about that. Let's go back to that. Going to the pause. Good. So, what we see here is the first one. We're going to start from the bottom, and we're going to work our way to the top. What happens here is that you can see that there's a particular uh, what we call an alert for command.exe. Um, it's it's opening from Adobe Reader. All right. We also see that after that, once we, that was our first prompt that said, hey, there's something weird, kind of weird going on in the background. But we continued on, and after that, we have some other process. And you'll notice it's called form.pdf. It's not even a .exe, a .bat, or anything like that. Um, on Windows, or on many systems, you can actually, any file can actually technically be an executable if you know how to execute it. So just keep that in mind. Um, we see the outbound connection. So again, from the endpoint perspective, if you had a remote user or uh, global user, someone sitting next door at Starbucks, any kind of components that you might have had, you might have spent maybe hundreds of, hundreds of million dollars on infrastructure, are almost worthless because if the user is not using your infrastructure, you're not going to get the logging capabilities. This allows you to actually see it from a, from a home user's perspective or from a remote, like a road warrior, right? We also have the capabilities of being able to identify certain other aspects. All those processes that were being created, we can see those kind of things. Again, looking at that forensic capability and from an incident response perspective, should, this, should we get these kind of logs and doing this in a post-mortem type of perspective? You look, uh, incident responders need to have some kind of, well, it helps them to have some kind of starting location, right? Knowing what files are being dropped, knowing where they're being dropped, what machines, what users, all that kind of information is very critical as opposed to giving them, I don't know, how many people have at least you know, 250 to 500 gigabytes of a hard drive, right? I remember, you know, for myself, I have at least almost two terabytes of hard drive space on my machine. Back in the olden days, and I say olden days with kind of a, with air quotes, you know, 40 gigabytes was a pretty large hard drive. And that would take roughly about, give or take about a week, maybe two weeks to actually process for one drive, one computer. And that's trying to do the analysis forensically. These days, Forensic, forensic, uh, forensic resources are inundated. They might have to do six or seven types of cases all at once. And it's a lot of data. Again, that's, that's what we talked about, that explosion of data. Being able to focus and harness and mitigate that potential and uh, really reduce that scope is huge for any incident response or forensic folks. Um, being also to be able to see exactly where these, these uh, tools are, which ones executed, and in what order is huge as well. All that forensic type of background, all that kind of auditing. If you remember, I executed that file called uh, stealthbat.exe. After that execution, we have a little tiny file. That's a little batch file. Uh, it's a little, basically a script file that was created. Um, typically, when these things happen, they're usually executed and then what they call melted or deleted, right? But 
right after that, we see also w.exe actually uh, executing. Now, I apologize if this is going to get a little too technical for, for some folks, but uh, it's, I, I think it would be nice to actually show some of the, some of the little tricks around, um, around all the network infrastructure components. What you'll see here is kind of more like a parlor trick. So that w.exe, if you had a network component or any kind of logging, typically what you'd see is an IP address or a host name going to a specific maybe destination IP address or URL. Now, if that URL happens to be something along the lines of like ads.shoppingnetwork.com or you know, anything preceded by ads or CDN, there's a lot of things with content delivery networks as well as ad servers that are very, very commonplace, especially if you're looking at the names. If you, look, if you notice the names here, I've obviously hacksawed the, the actual URLs to make it stand out a little bit more, but header, footer.jpegs, one by one bitmaps, Things are like called tracking pixels. If you're not familiar with tracking pixels, they're very, very small. Um, they're used to track your usage habits as well as a couple other kind of things uh, more on the malicious side, but uh, I won't get into that here. But if you saw this from a network level, this is hiding in plain sight for the fact that if you saw these from in the network logs, they would just appear to be uh, images because they actually are legitimate images in this particular example. But what happens further is that you're getting additional logs, and you can see that there's another, uh, another event where this file with no extension called foo in the temporary directory is actually be re being renamed to something called lsas.exe in the temporary directory. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, the file called lsas, it's, called, it's on Windows machines, it's, called, it's the local security authentication service or subsystem service. It basically handles your passwords. It handles all your, uh, all your authentication and authentication tokens on the machine. It's bad news if you ever see that, number one, executing from a temporary directory, just, just as a word, of, word to that wise. It's also very weird to see it uh, running underneath the user context, just for, again, for another little tidbit. Right? But the next thing we see, um, and um, I will say it again, going back to the kernel level, you also have the capabilities of dynamic file capture. So I mean, if you're injecting at such a low level, granted, there, there are some people who are petrified or terrified of having kernel level types of agents. But we have also another quote. But really, the belief is that if malware authors are using this type of technology, you're, you are forced to either use something of equal or better to actually combat them. And because malware is in the kernel, uh, it's one of the things where you're going to have to have to go. People don't want to do it because it's very difficult. But obviously looking for people that have experience in that and have a stable products, huge things as well. But here we can see that systemp.bat that we saw just a few minutes ago is actually has a little package icon. For us, what we can do is we can actually capture the actual dynamic, uh, the dynamic generation of those and bring them back to a console for, again, incident response analysts to be able to analyze. So in this case scenario, what we can do is we can actually grab, grab the file, open it up, and provide additional details to, in, a, in a perspective that incident responders would have never had. So again, if you're looking at, again, this is one of the reasons why I came back with my, I was describing my forensics experience. I'm very forensics heavy because it's, it's what I lived by. It's what I breathed every single day. That being said, I'm look, I, was, I was ecstatic to find tools anywhere that would help me reduce the amount of time staring at a black screen. It was crazy. But, we're not going to step by. We're not going to go through step by step, but I'll, I'll paraphrase. At the very top and the very bottom, you have something called like house cleaning routines. And house cleaning, you know, very similar to what you would do maybe during springtime, is, you know, it's deleting all the relevant files to itself. It's deleting itself. So the file that we are reading is actually was supposed to be deleted by the malware, but we actually were able to hold that up and uh, do a file capture of it, even though it technically did not exist. Uh, prior to that. Um, again, for network folks, uh, I'd, I'd be interested if you, if, you can, if you have any kind of uh, uh, rebuttals against this one. But lsas.exe, as we talked about, uh, it's in the temporary directory. I'm actually putting that, it's my mode of persistence. Uh, it's a remote shell, and I'm placing it in as a service. So anytime the person reboots, it's going to actually push out another remote command connection to myself, just for fun. right? The lsas.exe, when I build that, it's actually it's designed, obviously, to not be picked up by antivirus vendors. But how I get it on the machine is slightly different. I'll take that, and I'll actually encrypt that particular binary. And I'll actually, so, uh, sometimes they call it salami slicing, but uh, you can call it, you break it into three binary chunks. 
And each of those binary chunks of in that encrypted format, you then steganographically insert into each one of the images. So if you're looking at each one of these images, which are then being pulled down by that w.exe, individually, if you analyze them, again, if you're trying to do this on the network, on the fly, uh, I challenge the network vendors to be able to do that. Because again, I'd be very interested to see that. But taking those steganographic encrypted chunks, putting them down to the machine, sticking them back together after ripping them out steganographically from the, from the picture, and I hope everyone understands what the steganographics are. <laughs> but um, it's just basically hiding data inside pictures, essentially. You can also do it to other files or music files or anything like that. But ripping that out, putting them together in a, in a sequence that only I knew, and then decrypting that binary. You know, it basically, you know, I can do this with open source tools, and, or you guys could do this with open source tools in probably about maybe 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. So then you have a method of actually evading hundreds of millions of dollars of infrastructure with 45 minutes with open source tools, right? And it's like, again, you tell me if there's a gap in, in, that, in that kind of particular paradigm. But in this case scenario, again, what we're actually seeing um, is to be able to take that, again, have the context, not doing file capture on every single file, because that would just be kind of ridiculous, but, um, but being able to do it based on certain types of thresholds or certain things that may be, that may be suspicious and things that you might want to know more about. We also here, we see the port scanning activity. So again, from the perspective of a, a user or a perspective of a machine, very difficult in, a, in normal traditional senses to be able to identify when a machine is doing naughty things inside the, inside the normally trusted domain of your enterprise. But we can identify that because typically your, you know, win word, for example, should never be, uh, which is Microsoft Word, it should never be port scanning your Active Directory server, for example. Just for, just a, yeah, just another little thing. But, um, this is the last alert, and it's a suspicious binary reading or trying to attempt to read on sensitive data. So the confidential.txt file was something that, okay, we already identified and can be identified automatically or persisted as well. And we can talk about that a little, a little bit later, but know that the technology to be able to identify data is there in whatever method that you choose. And that being said, when a suspicious process that shouldn't have no business touching <coughs> sensitive data actually touches it, you block it, show the alert, show the user, show the computer, show the date and timestamp, and show that it was blocked, right? So auditing purposes. Now that being said, a last alert, but not the last action. So uh, how many people know anything about memory forensics or memory dumping, right? Yeah, all right, we've got hands, yes. So um, a lot of times you also have this paradigm where um, malware writers started to encrypt their files, right? Not only just pack them or try to obfuscate the, the code that kind of gets around different types of antivirus vendors, but they started to encrypt them. So when they execute, they actually decrypt themselves and then they, they jam themselves into memory of the computer or what's called your RAM, right? Um, what we can do also is that at that point in time, when malware is most uh, active, we dump the RAM and we do an analysis right on the spot, right? So Taking this in perspective, from a forensics and IR uh, kind of per, uh, perspective, when an IR team is actually called in, it could be hours, it could be days, potentially weeks before an IR team actually ever has physical remote hands or actual hands on the machine or the hard drive in question. That being said, to take the memory dump or to dump anything that was actually active on the machine is very difficult because, you know, again, you're not there, right? This eliminates, again, shortening the time, the time to actually be able to react to something. Being able to identify or pull down, it's kind of like, uh, some might, might cringe at the, the analogy here, but ripping the shower curtain open when someone's taking a shower, when they're not, they're least expecting it, right? But exactly, when it's most sensitive to being actually active and being able to identify certain types of uh, categories of traits of what the malware is doing. A lot of malware sleeps, it kind of gets a little bit, it, it lays in wait, it maybe even, it maybe just kind of, just kind of skulking around. But when it's most active, what we do is we can actually identify the virtual address space, uh, where it's located. We can actually do also the analysis of what types of functions or what types of capabilities does that piece of uh, code have, even though it's in RAM. We can take a look at those particular types of code, traits, and all that kind of thing. Be a bit, create a numerical score. And again, context is key. It's not just the fact that something can grab your, your camera and maybe grab some keystrokes. It could be Skype, right? It could, it could be another pro program that's more malicious. But how it's being used, what it's accessing, all those kind of capabilities, 
context is king and context is the key to that kind of capability. But being able to identify all that kind of stuff is really, again, so trying to take all that, all of what I was taking before in terms of the concepts of having the, having the capabilities of identifying malware specific events plus the context of using that with how that those events are related to data really is, I mean, it's, it's here today. And it's something that's possible, but very, very few people actually, actually employ that. And even fewer people actually even actively classify or are able to uh, quantitatively classify their data, right? Just because, you know, it's, it's not something that's been seen as, uh, as, a, very, uh, as a very effective means. But uh, I'm hoping that people can, based on what I was just showing you, can, can actually see that there is a lot of value based on that. So without that, I'll kind of move over here. That's the demo. So again, we're moving back into the next gen network kind of endpoint kind of location. Um, and when you're looking at, it comes back down to the kind of the, the Manning and the Snowden types of effects. You have those capabilities where if you're looking purely for cyber attacks and malware related events, it's great because if they're breaking against, if they're break, coming up and breaking against the, the infrastructure, the, the side of the castle, fantastic. But when you're welcoming those things in and you're looking at the, the, the more modern face of technology and the way enterprises work these days. Remote users, everyone here has got a mobile device, the laptops, uh, you know, maybe home workers could be that as well. You, you start looking at the different types of technologies that can actually identify those things, especially with, again, when they have the authorized user with the authorized access, but with malicious intent, right? And it's being able to, being able to identify and make sure that from, from the get-go, that people have that security policy in place and that they're able to enforce that security policy uh, from, from the endpoint, but also to be able to uh, identify that, and mix it, and marry it with the different types of malware components and be able to stop that malware attack also from occurring. So a couple of things I guess I want to leave. Um, if you guys have never heard of uh, uh, Securosis or Mike Rothman, he's got a great, he's got a great security blog, um, uh, nice little uh, security, uh, security consulting firm that, uh, that they have, uh, Securosis. And this, this kind of echoes back to what I was mentioning before. Malware is going to the rootkit, uh, is, going to the, is going into the kernel. In order to combat that, you should really be going to the kernel as well. Um, but three kind of aspects that we look for in terms of a uh, more, uh, more comprehensive strategy for in securing the enterprise. You want to be able to monitor, and monitoring, as we noticed before, monitoring just at the, at the network, just not enough. Monitoring even at, uh, at the endpoint, just uh, this, a lot of people also got into the thing of SIMS, big data analytics and whatnot, but I think there's very limited value in terms of a Windows error message or just different types of Windows error logging. Um, there's no context, and again, as I mentioned, I'm a big fan of context, right? So being, having, having some capability of being able to log things, um, also especially logging things in, in, a, in a method that is compliant to certain EU privacy laws as well, right? You don't want things that can log every piece of data. If you have net witness or things that just grab packets as they're a raw, you're gonna come, to, come across with data across borders issues, you're gonna come across with the, maybe potential privacy laws against workers' councils. Being able to have that flexibility to, to find something that allows you to both um, log the data and or potentially not log the data but still protect the data is, is, is something to look at. But being able to prompt, as we showed before, having the capability and crowdsourcing essentially your security. You know, you want to enable and push and instill accountability and responsibility to your users. It's not necessarily saying that, hey, you know, and it's like, I'm going to block this because it looks bad. But just telling, just in a normal everyday kind of situation, if someone's trying to move some data to a USB drive or something like that, you know, give them a little prompt. Put a say, hey, you know, this is acceptable usage policy for this. And, you know, this data that you took, by the way, it's got some sensitive data in it. Just, just wanted to remind you, but allow them to do it. You're going to see massive amounts of behavioral education, behavioral changes within an organization. I can guarantee it. Um, and then being able to obviously proactively block a lot. A lot of the solutions, they're, they're, they're either hesitant on it or they're just kind of scared because blocking, it's like, ooh, getting in the way of the user. It's like stopping or interrupting business, business process. Very scary stuff. But when it comes down to it, it you got to have some kind of, you got to have to, you have to have some kind of teeth, right? 
a lot of a lot of different products out there who might be kind of user level or whatnot, they don't have the capability of blocking at the at a network capability or a network level. You got to have something that runs deep and that has the capability of saying, hey, you know what? That ain't good. I'm just going to stop it flat out. Or again, I'm going to buy more time so that we can look at it a little bit more in depth. Right? But having these these three components uh, as seminal seminal foundations to it to, to helping to secure the enterprise are very very key. Right. We also come down to the point of you know looking for different types of companies that have both experience, the coverage, the scale. You know, having the scale of maybe a, over a couple hundred thousand agents, depending on the size of your organization. Looking at being able to have also coverage within Linux, Mac OS X, as well as Windows. Having experience to be able to deploy all these things and support them. Um, obviously, having the innovation, looking for that kind of marriage, looking at it from a little bit more outside the box. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a new type of concept to be able to look at the data and then to also look at the, look at the malware-related events and be able to combine them. I don't think it's a new concept, but it just hasn't been done because I think a lot of people think it's way too hard. But if you look hard enough, there are solutions that do it. Right? Um, and obviously, being flexibility. Right? Every organization is a little different in some way. They all have your quirks. But being able to be flexible in that kind of solution, kind of solution set, the more flexible, you know, it can be a double-edged sword, granted. But the more flexible it is, you're using the same product for multiple different types of use cases, whether, 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 whatever it may be, obviously can save you money on the bottom line. But, so um, as we approach the hour here, I just wanted to say that um, if there's any questions or whatnot, uh, based on what I was presenting to you, if anyone had any potential acknowledgments or affirmations as well, or rebuttals, uh, I'm more than happy. Hi, uh, Nigel Rumble. Um, just one very quick question. Uh, you, you, the example you gave was uh, Windows using a, a direct uh, execution uh, attack. Sure. Um, a lot of folks out there, a lot of my colleagues, uh, a lot of companies that uh, we do business with, uh, you know, they use uh, Unix or they use uh, sure. uh, Mac uh, OS uh, 10, um, which uh, isn't quite so vulnerable to that type of attack. I mean, in your experience, um, uh, is, is that true, uh, that OS... Uh, 10 is, uh, is not so vulnerable to this type of attack, or if it is, do you also cover support for that product? Uh, simple question. Sure. So whether it's not more, I guess it's all a question of what do you want to have happen, right? If an attacker wants to get in, uh, I mean, if, a if an attacker knows that you're using OS X, I mean, the, there's a, there was a, uh, if you're not if you're not familiar, there was an actual contest. Just a few, it just ended a few days ago. It's called Pwn to Own, uh, and they brought all the different browsers uh, up against different research engineers, and every single one of the major browsers fell with remote execution vulnerabilities. Um, some of them with multiple by different uh, different researchers. If they want to get in, they can. They can. I, I think it's I think it's I think it's a personally I think it's a marketing scheme for a lot of people to say that ah, you know I got a Mac, you know I don't have the software. It's just like, uh, I mean, you have these different capabilities. I mean, Droid, the Android, Android devices, a lot of the malware now is focusing really on the Android devices. And that's, it's running a basically a Linux variant. Uh, to, I mean, at its core, it's very similar to that. But the, the capabilities of, uh, again, you know, again, shameless plug, my company actually has agents that run both on, are on Linux, OS X, as well as Windows. But that being said, you know, it's like, I think, all those operating systems, because they all carry data, they're going to be a target. And they have been, um, mostly for, some of them more for potential malware, malware points where they're trying to generate revenue through, ad, so through additional click, uh, click jackings or whatnot. But you know, if they really wanted to do that, I mean, if you haven't read some of the, um, also, I'm not sure if you've, you folks are familiar with a, a kind of a security pundit named Bruce Schneier. He's got a nice blog as well, and he has, uh, He's basically got different, um, different capability, uh, different uh, NSA exploits of the day. It's it's it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, you you'd be able to see that there's a lot of things that probably we'd be able to focus on on those particular types of attacks as well. It, I don't think any of those. I don't think any of the OSs are are going to be safe from that. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, thank you for the presentation. Is there uh, an option where, uh, in your solution, 
where I can prevent the exploit from actually um, giving a reverse shell. So I say, don't run the exploit because there might be somebody clever than my software I and mean, maybe sure. try to disable it on the, the, the kind of driver that is um, protecting the, the data. Sure, sure. So, I mean, through the, the demo also, I mean, again, it's a demo, but it showed that if you wanted to stop it from actually initiating the exploit, we could have stopped it. And we, that would have effectively stopped the reverse shell from actually going outbound as well. Um, any way, any, at any point along that line within the, within the demo could have been actually stopped. Because, I mean, it's all, they're all events. And each, each event in its atomic state could be blocked. The question, again, being the context thing, is when do you want to stop it or how do you want to stop it? At what point, right? Um, I mean, instead of it being uh, the choice of the user in front of the screen to make, I mean, can the admin or the security engineer actually say, sure. you know? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and this, again, this was just for, you know, if there was no prompt, it would be very little to show in terms of the demo, right? So the, the option for automatic blocking is there. But that's, that poses a much more potentially terrifying question of <laughs> blocking things and having the user have no idea what's going on in the background. But um, Good question, though. Thank you. Anyone else? No? OK. So uh, I guess with that, I mean, just to kind of leave it off, um, to talking about a little bit about the company, we're, we've had Gartner verify and acknowledge that we can literally see almost everything on the machine. So all those different types of events, uh, just seeing things, though, isn't enough. Being able to control those is the, one of the biggest keys. And one of the things that when we're looking at either uh, technically skilled insiders or different types of advanced malware, being able to be able to combine, again, that capability of visibility and control with the data is one the number one thing. If you guys have any other additional questions also, we, we are definitely running some kind of sp some specials. Please see us at the booth. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>